You're listening to Spotlight, the podcast that fosters connections with veterans and military spouses. Here's your host, Bob Lowden. Welcome, everybody. This is Bob Lowden, the host of the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. Uh, pleased to have as my guest today, Dr. Kendra Lowe. I'm going to read a little expert here. I uh, don't often do this, but I'll do my best uh, and quote the following. My path walked as a cadet at the Air Force Academy, an active duty service member, and now as a military spouse, has given me a front row seat to some of the traumas, setbacks, successes, discrimination, and celebrations that military families experience. The common bond of this lifestyle and its unique challenges has resulted in what Cheryl Sandberg, author of Option B, has coined as a collective resilience or a way of life that allows a military spouse to come to grips with the adversities they face and keep moving forward. The more military spouses I met, the more I noticed a cycle of acceptance, resetting, and perseverance that, is th that this unique lifestyle calls a military spouse to manage. As she said, she's the author of Wake Up, Kick Ass, and Repeat. Kendra, thank you so much for being a guest and for stepping into the spotlight this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, I say this all the time um, when I get an opportunity to talk about my work and my passion that it fills me up. And so any chance I get to, I jump on it because I think it's so important that we continue the conversation about uh, military spouse stress and about um, social emotional health within our military families. Well, I always like to start out, uh, you know, you're an Air Force Academy grad. How did, uh, how did you wind up going to the Air Force Academy? Uh, so my father um, was a 1972 uh, graduate of the Academy. So of course, uh, I knew about uh, the Academy because he graduated from there. And I uh, actually remember going through uh, my senior year in the application process and uh, talking to my parents about it in which my father sat me down and specifically encouraged me not to go to the academy, uh, probably because to be honest with you, um, just knowing uh, the hardships faced there and um, the additional layer of stress that it would uh, impose as being a female going to the academy. But um, if anybody's met me and known my nature, I took that on as a personal challenge. And if he probably would have used reverse psychology on me, uh, it would have worked better. But it really just challenged me to take on something um, that I knew um, would be hard and that I could uh, challenge not only me, myself um, academically, but personally and, and grow from it. When you graduated from the Air Force Academy, you went on active duty, what, what did you do? I was a personnelist, uh, so worked uh, in primarily the military personnel flight was what it was called at that time, and then had the opportunity uh, to be immersed in the security forces squadron and be a, a section commander within the security forces and um, enjoyed all my experiences, I really did. And um, to be honest, I say it often, it was really hard for me to hang up my uniform um, while my husband continued to wear his. Did you guys meet in the military, I wonder? So we met at the academy, which is kind of a funny story. Um, we had actually um, previously met, we both went to sports camp at the academy and um, met through mutual friends and um, did not like each other. And <laughs> okay. when we met between our freshman and sophomore year again, um, he more had the visual recognition of who I was. I did not remember him. And he's like, you don't remember me from sports camp? And I said, no. And he said, I clearly remember you. And it just stemmed a conversation of all um, the unique things that we have in common. Um, his father was also an academy graduate. And we were born at the same hospital here in San Antonio at Wilford Hall a month apart. So uh, just made an immediate connection. And um, I certainly attribute a lot of being able to overcome the challenges at the Academy of having him as not only um, a friend, but someone who ended up becoming my husband. It's, it's interesting. You should tell him that I said, well, it sounds like he turned that franchise around from sports camp to, to later if he can you know, <laughs> turn that one around. That's that's kind of funny. I uh, uh, OK, so um, you made uh, you made the transition from uh, active duty 
to a military spouse. And I've had some guests on that have, have done that as well. Uh, but that's kind of an entirely different uh, frame of reference. You go from being active duty and kind of having all of the benefits and privileges to stepping into the role of uh, a military spouse. Talk a little bit about that particular transition, maybe how it happened for you and, and, uh, and what's different about that, uh, having worn the uniform. So it wasn't um, a decision that was taken lightly. Um, at the time, my husband was picked up um, to cross commission um, from being a civil engineer to a combat rescue officer. And at that time, just knowing um, I had uh, potentially some moves associated with my job and him going through the pipeline is what they call it the first year, it was gonna be a lot of time apart. And at that point, we had already spent a year apart um, stationed at two different locations. And we just kind of sat down and um, thought about it of this is um, this is going to be an ongoing challenge that we have to face. And so um, naturally, um, I wanted to pursue um, my education. And so um, it was a, a good decision for us, um, for me to hang up the uniform and for him to continue to wear it. But I honestly think I was... Um, naive uh, to how significant that transition would be uh, because I was a military spouse. Um, the entire time I was also active duty, I was his spouse and didn't really bear it much thought or weight of that transition. And what I felt was significant. So I stepped into that role as a spouse. And as you mentioned, um, I just didn't give a lot of thought to when you move and you have that automatic um, friendship within a squadron, that automatic uh, transition uh, to colleagues, to purpose um, with employment and felt a significant amount of stress. And so because of that, that's really what stemmed my research into military spouse stress, because when I sat down and thought about it, I really questioned, is this unique to me? Am I the only one that's feeling significant stress associated with being a military spouse and had the opportunity at that time, I was in my master's program and thought it was a perfect um, research project to look and see is military spouse significant and, um, and how significant is it? You, you also went from uh, you know, being uh, within an organization that was going to manage uh, most of the details of, of any transfer that you made uh, to being a military spouse where none of those resources are really available. Uh, now all of a sudden you're making the same kind of move, but you don't have the bench to draw upon to help you with that process. Doesn't that, is that an accurate depiction of, of, a, of a major difference? Absolutely. and I. I think it just lends the hand to lack of control. And I know that we have a lot of lack of control in the military, but uh, it's more profound for a military spouse uh, because there's so many other things that are part of it uh, that you don't have, feel as though you don't have as much choice in. So you, uh, at, at that point, you decide to go back and get a master's degree and, and talk a little bit about the thought process there. So this was a, maybe a passion for you, uh, what you're pursuing? Absolutely, because um, it, it was driven from my personal experiences. So I really wanted to look at that if it was, uh, if I was the only one experiencing it or if there was more military spouses out there that were experiencing significant stress. And with any research, I really wanted to be able to come out from it and say, here's two contributing factors. You know, Here's two things that are directly linked with clinical levels of stress and military spouses. Um, I wanted to be able to speak to that, uh, to help provide more resources, to develop more resources for military families to help mitigate some of that stress. You, you go on uh, and earn your PhD uh, and um, talk a little bit about some of the research that you conducted while you were, uh, you know, working on your doctorate. Um, so again, I was fortunate um, in my master's program, I saw some concerning trends, but as you know, it was a smaller sample size and really couldn't make profound statements that it transcend to the entire population because it was small. So in that um, doctoral research, I was so excited because I was able to expand it. So my original research was um, solely Air Force military spouses. I was able to include Army military spouses and Navy military spouses. 
and broaden that spectrum and broaden that scope to see if those original trends really did transcend to a larger population. So essentially my doctoral work was uh, stemmed from my master's and expanded um, to look at those trends. You, you, you make me uh, ask a question and maybe we need to come back to it in a few minutes, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious if one branch or another of the military maybe in your opinion has a better model. Uh, you know, it, it's what I found with the research. And so um, two key findings that I'll touch on real quick is one is that military spouses do, um, it, do feel significant stress. And in fact, one in four um, noted that they were at clinical levels of stress. And so to, um, to those clinical levels of stress are those that would warrant immediate professional intervention. And to me, um, the potential that in a room of spouses that one in four could be experiencing that is significant because we walk around um, with a very tough exterior and are often um, hesitant to share the struggles that we're going through. And by simply speaking to that alone, um, validates military spouse stress and allows those that are hesitant to seek help um, to reach out for help. And then the other one that you noted, um, which I had a hard time with, because as I said, I wa really wanted to find two you know, contributing factors to this. And when I sat down and the research started coming in, um, I wasn't finding those factors and I was frustrated. But when I looked at um, what I found or what I essentially didn't find, it depicted a, a picture which, which you um, mentioned is that we have biases associated with uh, who, what military spouses could be experiencing more stress and, and those that could not. And one of them being that certain services um, have more stress associated with them than others. And so what I found was there was no difference in clinical um, stress across branches of service. There was also no difference um, in clinical stress across length in service. And I think that's important because we also have that bias that um, veteran or seasoned spouses don't experience as much stress. And so what the research reflected is that, that cl those clinical levels of stress were constant across the board. And so what I speak about a lot is really um, as a military community, trying to remove some of those biases we have um, because it prevents us from being able to see military spouses that could be suffering from clinical amounts of stress. So you, you threw out a number, you said one in four. So if there are 800,000 military spouses give or take, you're saying that 200,000 are exhibiting some form of mental stress as a result of the pressure that's on them. Is, 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 is what, what rises to the level maybe of mental illness within that category, you know, a clinical depression or, or those types of things help me stratify it perhaps. So one, you know, distinction that I will make is the research suggests Okay. So, um, you know, I have not been able to verify that and validate that through um, serving all military spouses. So that's one thing, important thing to keep in mind is that is that is what the research suggested. Um, the numbers could be based upon um, my sample population. So the nine and 10 that I talk about clinical levels of stress, um, I did not specifically look at those were, that were um, either seeking professional help or in professional health. But what I used was um, a valid, I get the question a lot, did you have spouses just raise their hand and say that they're stressed? No, I used um, a valid psychometric tool that's um, used within our military communities as well to measure that. And so what it means is when they're at those clinical levels of stress, those are ones that are typically demonstrating markers or characteristics of anxiety, depression, severe avoidance. Let's, uh, uh, let me, I wanna come back to this thread, but before we do that, when, when did you sort of discover that you were an author and, and when did you make the conscious decision to write you know, wake up, kiss, kick ass and repeat. So that was over in Okinawa. And um, for me, uh, that assignment was um, created a significant amount of stress for me. When we arrived on the island um, that night, 
I found out that it wasn't a two-year assignment, that it was actually a four-year assignment. And it shifted for me um, from being an adventure and immersing myself in a new culture and being excited about um, the possibilities to a lifetime. Four years was four years away from grandparents and um, chances for um, extended family members to watch my children grow. And so I really had a difficult time shifting my negative thoughts um, about the experience to positive thoughts when I found that out. And um, I started speaking about that more and relating it back to my research and started going out to spouses and um, spouse groups and talking about clinical levels of stress and sharing how it affected me as well, that assignment. And I had a lot of spouses come up and they, you know, they said, well, you presented the problem, you know, we could potentially be at clinical levels of stress. What do we do with that? And I thought, you know, that's a great question. What do you do with that? I had tools, you know, that I could suggest to them. But I went back and thought about um, what if they were all together and what if they were compiled? And so my husband and I were walking one night and he's like, you've always toyed with the idea of writing a book. He's like, you have it now. You have the subject matter. You know what um, you know what you want to speak to. You know the population that you want to help and you know how you can go write it. And at first it was intimidating because um, I'm more of a clinical writer and I've certainly never written a book before, but I think that also goes back to the importance of taking risk. And I just said, you know what, I'm going to do it. And so I sat down on the camping chairs as they were packing up our house in Okinawa and just started writing. And I finished it within, I finished the, the manuscript within eight weeks because it was there. It was in my head. It was experiences of my own and of other military spouses and I wanted to be able to meet with each spouse individually, which is impossible. So the best way I thought to meet them where they're at is give them a book and talk to them where they're at in their homes. Let, let's, let's talk about mental illness in the military a little bit. Um, uh, one of my previous guests um, uh, developed a, a methodology for members of the military to anonymously seek uh, mental health support because there is so much of a stigma just in society in general about mental illness. And there is uh, certainly a fear within the military that, you know, if I go get help, uh, it's going to impact my career. It might impact my, uh, uh, you know, my security clearance. It, it, it could have an impact on my promotion or, you know, or, or my command or whatever the case may be. It, are there parallels within the, within the spouse community, uh, you know, the stigma to, to seek help? Is that part of the problem? Absolutely. And I, I want to say um, with a surety that I believe the military is doing a much better job. We're, um, the military is trying very hard to reduce that stigma, but is it still present? It is. And um, part of it is them building new resources that bypass some of those fears and anxiety and concerns about receiving help, one being um, the MFLAX and military family life uh, counselors, and they're extremely uh, present, especially overseas. And the great thing about MFLAX is that they don't take notes and they're there to help and it's, uh, it's readily available. And so oftentimes with military spouses that I noticed that hesitation, um, I had a, a list ready to go of MFLAX that could see them. If I had my wish, uh, there would be an MFLAC in every single squadron and every single unit, because I do believe there's a need. And again, the great thing about that program is it um, mitigates some of those fears. Are those, uh, are those individuals that are in that particular role, are they uh, uh, specifically clinically tra trained or is that individual uh, assign that duty sort of as many military units assign duty, you know, extra duty officer sort of a thing. They are civilians and they're all licensed counselors. Yes. And so they, um, you know, it, 
working closely with many MPLAX overseas and even um, here in the States, uh, it's interesting what they what they do. They do normally um, a three year or three month um, tour in different locations and travel all throughout the world, um, helping military families. So uh, I I like it for so many reasons. I could probably go on and on, but the other part of it is uh, not having the uniform on. I think makes a difference for military spouses at, as well. I think there's a lot of environments and situations. Uh, that the, the uniform itself um, presents that visible, tangible barrier, um, not just for mental health, um, but for the reasons that you stated. So the fact that they're civilians um, makes it a more comfortable environment. And I do believe um, military spouses are more apt to open up and to reach out to those individuals. One of the numbers that I read and, and some of the things that you've written is that um, something in, in the neighborhood of 123 military spouses actually take their own lives in a year. That you know, certainly is not the magnitude of the 22 a day number that we hear from veterans, but at the same time, it's astounding to me because I would imagine that, that the vast majority of the spouses are women, maybe it's 90%. Um, you know, is, is that number mostly women? Uh, is that number uh, got some men in it? Uh, what, what is, how does that break down? It's primarily women. And if you, and it's hard to look at trends at this point, because 2019 was the first time that they reported on it. Um, and those numbers were from 2017. So, uh, I'm thrilled um, that, there's, that, that the Department of Defense is starting to track that because I think it's important to look at uh, and to validate the severe um, stress that military spouses are experiencing uh, and they're continuing to track it, but it's just, it's new and it was a fight. There's been a lot of individuals that um, took that on uh, to, um, uh, took that on as a personal passion to ensure that we're not only looking at active duty members, but military spouses as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about the makeup and the flow of your book. I, uh, in some cases, get to read my uh, guest book in advance, but have only seen uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, reviews of it at this point. Talk a little bit about the process of the book, and if, if a military spouse were to pick it up, what they might expect to be taken through uh, in the course of reading your book. So the book was developed um, to be read individually, but um, the hidden purpose of it was for military spouses to pick it up together. So one thing that we see as a continuing concern within military communities and spouses is a feeling of isolation and um, lack of social connection. And especially in today's environment with COVID. Yeah, that COVID is kind of a force multiplier in the mental illness uh, space. It is exacerbated everything that we felt up until that point. So the book um, has been highly successful uh, with small groups of spouses that have picked it up and worked through the eight week study together. So there's reflection questions as they go through each chapter, building on tools to help them with their social and emotional health. But then that connection of going through those reflection questions together as a group I've been invited to come on to several now Zoom meetings of spouses that I've met going through the study, and I'm just floored every single time at within an eight-week period of time, uh, the connection that they have with, with each other. And I've reached back to several of those groups, and they continued their weekly Zoom meeting because they did form significant bonds with those spouses. And we look at research um, and it does show that social connection is so important for our mental health and well-being. So truly, it was written for spouses to get together, to work through together, to share some of the struggles that they've had, and then collectively work through how can we build tools um, to help with that stress that we feel. You know, uh, uh, anonymously, have you got any, any maybe success stories that you can share you know, obviously without disclosing any 
any uh, uh, secrets or so forth. But you know, I, when, when it's a good thing and a good outcome, it must be very rewarding. Are there some some stories that you might share with us that that would uh, t talk about the impact of your work? Absolutely. It's uh, I've gotten so much feedback, and at times um, it it causes me to pause because I'm so excited that it's helped individuals. And that was the main intention. I told myself if by writing this book on a camp chair helps five military spouses, then it was worth every single minute. So um, receiving those emails back has been powerful and really um, driven me to write more uh, resources for military families. But one in particular, when you ask for an example, um, as a military spouse that was brand new um, to the culture. And so just um, learning how to function uh, in a new, um, in a new, completely new environment and found out that her spouse was deploying. And so experiencing a lot of those challenges associated with military life had just moved, was isolated from peers and friends and experiencing a pending deployment. And what I loved is that someone that I had stayed in connection with recognized that in a friend and invited her to join uh, the spouse group that started with my book study. And I received a picture of her sitting um, with her child on her lap with my book. And she said at the, that truly was the reason that she made it through the deployment. And to me, uh, yes, um, there are many stressors associated with military life, but deployments are significant. So if that gave her the edge, if that gave her um, the hope to get through that deployment, uh, that, that was extremely rewarding to read. So uh, the, the, the book uh, came out, what, last year, last Janu January? January 2019. Did you have a, uh, a book tour and some speaking on the docket until, what, the 1st of March, and then maybe the rug got yanked out from under you? It did. So I was uh, excited. I had a couple trips planned, uh, March to go up to Alaska to do a spouse symposium, and then D.C. in March as well to go out for the E9 um, promotion that I was invited by Chief Wright to come speak at and, and COVID. Uh, so, but there's a silver lining of COVID. The great thing is I, I've been invited to a lot of speaking engagements and often I have to use the power of saying no because I still have three little kids and a husband that's active duty. So the great thing is as we're doing today, a lot of it can be done virtually. So I've continued to do presentations for spouses uh, first quadrants for organizations and wings um, to speak about military spouse stress. So uh, it, it's been an adventure and I've loved every minute of it. Yeah, I was going to ask you, you, obviously you've had to pivot, you know, as a result. And how often are you speaking? I mean, how, how many virtual engagements are you doing now? Oh my gosh, if I tallied them up um, for various, uh, as it, podcast speaking events um, at least two a week right now. Mm. Uh, again, just trying to um, continue the conversation that's going. So I think that's invaluable is um, individuals like you that are reaching out that want to know about it uh, so that the military community continues to talk about it. And um, I love it. So uh, I continue to do it and look forward to a lot of more in the future this year. Um. In, interesting stuff, and in, in, in just is just out of curiosity. So you run a a, a webinar or seminar. How long does you know? Would you typically a squadron get the spouses together and then participate in a group? And and how long is a is a typical uh, presentation? Is this a an hour, a half a day, a day? What uh, what what are you offering? Right now, uh, I've done both a half an hour and an hour, but I'm looking at expanding it because um, I've had the opportunity this year um, writing another book. And so that book uh, essentially will be material to expand upon the presentation. So um, I look forward to um, more opportunities to do more of a workshop uh, type structure as opposed to just a half an hour or hour presentation. Nice, very nice. I want to do a shout out. Um, you know, uh, you you came on my radar screen because of uh, Freedom Makers, but uh, I want to give a shout out to Laura Renner. Uh, it turns out you guys were roommates at the Air Force Academy. 
Yes, um, I have not seen her in a while just because of life, but I uh, had the, Laura came through while we were in North Carolina and she got to meet um, my, I think it was just one child that I had at the time. And so when we've had opportunities to reconnect, we have, and I've um, followed her and we've stayed in close touch and I'm just extremely impressed with what she's doing to continue uh, supporting military families. So uh, I have great memories of her my junior and senior year and um, just a fantastic individual that's um, making great, great growth and strides. Freedom, Freedom Makers provides uh, virtual assistance of which I and now am the beneficiary <laughs> and uh, just a great model because it does not matter where these uh, primarily military spouses are who are providing these services to people like me. How do, how do uh, people find your book and how do folks get in touch and follow you? So right now my landing page is Dr. Kendra Lowe, thrive on LLC.com, which is a little bit long and certainly can email me at Dr. Kendra at iCloud.com. So I um, receive daily messages about uh, either just um, wondering more about the work or um, potential presentations. And in, I encourage anybody to reach out that wants more information about what um, I've done in the past or what I'm currently working on. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the amazing thing for me is how quickly these little sessions go by. We, we're sort of bumping up now against our, our time limit. Uh, Dr. Kendra Lowe, thank you so much for stepping into the spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me today. We will place uh, on the landing page on our website links to uh, Kendra and uh, her book. And I would encourage everyone to consider, uh, sp specifically military spouses, consider checking out Wake Up, Kick Ass, and Repeat by Dr. Kendra Lowe. You've been listening to the Spotlight on the Veteran Crowd Network. We air on Tuesdays and third on Fridays. And we're bringing military veterans and spouses who are making a difference in our community. Dr. Lowe, thank you so much to you for being on the program. Bravo Zulu, and that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to Spotlight by Veteran Crowd. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and uploads, please visit our website at veterancrowdnetwork.com. We'll see you next time.